day of rest. <laughs> hey, over in the Middle East, they all have one room. Don't tell Lee that. <laughs> Lee would get an idea. He's like, I'm selling my house and buying one big room. <laughs> yes, yes. We're blessed. Thank God. Oh, rough stuff, right? Eating caribou meat, that's good stuff. Raw? Oh, that's gross. I think Paul would eat that. Why could I see Paul out there with a knife eating raw caribou meat? Oh, I could see him doing that out there. Paul, have you ever been into any raw meat like that? Have you ever done that in your life? That you can remember? Did you ever like bite into a deer heart or anything like that? No, nothing like that. Nothing like that. John, did you? Confession time. Did you, Garrett? Did you eat that badger that was outside of your house? What about the gopher? I did see Paul eat bugs. You know, if we were Roman Catholic, we could really twist this around on Paul. We saw him and he eats stuff that eats raw stuff and eats bugs. Something wrong with him. Unclean animals. Then he's eating bugs. All right, Romans chapter 12. We're going to finish up what we started here this morning. And uh, next week we'll get back to Next week I want to, Lord willing, uh, bring you, I want to kind of catch us up from in Baptist history next week, from what happened on the side of Roman Catholicism from the time of the 3rd century till the time of the 10th, 9th century or 10th century. I want to kind of catch us up, and I'm going to do that by reading J.A. Wiley's work because he has some fascinating things that he says, and he's going to give us the other side. We've talked about, like, the Wal or the uh, uh, the uh, Paulicians and the Albigenses and the Donatists, the Novationists, and those people, but we're going to, next week we're going to kind of show from the other perspective, the other side of what Rome was doing, uh, you know, and what, how that formed so, uh, that monstrosity. We're going to really, we're going to read, uh, because Jay Wiley has a great account of that, and he talks about it. And it's important to Baptist history for us to understand kind of what happened there. So I read that this week, and I was just fascinated by it. I thought, you know what, this would be good, because this guy, Jay Wiley, is an honest historian, but boy, is he really, he doesn't give Rome any breaks at all, man. He tells the truth about them and what, and their, what they did, and that's important to do. But it's important for us to understand how that monstrosity got the way it is, and he wrote very well on that. So we'll, we'll cover that. Then we're going to finish up the following week, Lord willing, with the Albigenses, somewhat of most of their account. We'll, we'll pick them back up in like the 12th or the 13th century possibly there and uh, but then we're gonna kind of backtrack a little bit to the the petro and peter of de bruce and a few of those other guys and we're going to read some of their testimonies and accounts so there's a lot of good things coming up with that that prove by the way that none of those groups were manichaeans as well which was a fierce charge that was made against them and a stain that was tried to put upon them by by the roman catholicism but anyway we'll talk about that last week i had planned on finishing uh, this this morning, but I didn't. So Romans chapter 12, verse number one. We're, we're really, actually, turn to Ephesians, please. Ephesians, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter five, because I'm going to start here and I want to talk about have a, a holy fight for your family. And really to, to talk about this. Now, again, I put this sermon together on Thursday, but the Lord had led me Thursday night to put this together. And, and just looking at a few things and thinking about a few things and everything like that. Um, so I, I want you to think about the importance of that. But the Bible says here in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. So the first point I want to make, let's pray. Father, Lord, please be with us now. Help us, Lord. Guide us through the scriptures. And thank you for the scriptures, Lord. Help us to live them. Help us to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. The first point this, this evening here, you need to have a holy fight for your family. Satan wants your sons and daughters. He wants them. He wants to sift them as wheat. He wants to destroy them. He wants your testimony. Remember, he is that roaring lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And that includes your family. And you better be ready to fight for your family. And not give up and become derelict in your duty and become some kind of lazy warrior. You husbands need to fight for your wife. You need to fight to protect her from the devil, from discouragements, and from a lack of contentment. You need to know your, heart, your wife's heart. You need to understand it and know it. You need to draw things out of it. You need to learn your wife. You learn to dwell with her as the weaker vessel. That means that I, I, I draw out of her and I'm watching and I'm learning about her and I'm watching uh, some things that she may need to work on. And I don't overlook those things, but I pray about those things and I talk to her about those things and I'm patient with her about those things. But I'm always pressing her forward in learning and growing and understanding. That's just not facts that you learn or knowledge that you gain, but it's knowledge with temperance and charity and brotherly kindness. It's teaching them to love. Also, you teach them to love as Christ loved the church. You teach them, by the way, the Bible says you teach that by you loving them, by you loving your wife. That's how you teach her. Here's the thing. How you treat your wife is how your sons and daughters will treat their, their, their spouses. If you're mean to your wife, if you yell at her, if you speak evil or ill against her, if you talk down to her, your, your children will do the same thing to their spouse. If you yell and holler at them, if you, if you speak uh, in a reproachful manner towards them, they're going to do that too. They're, they're going to pick that, that behavior up. If you're a woman that is loud, they're going to learn to be loud. They're going to learn to be angry. If you're a man that, that, that can't control your composure, keep your composure, then you're teaching your sons and your daughters to do the same thing. You're teaching them that. No, I'm not. I tell them to do right. Yeah, I know, but when you don't do right, you're teaching them to do wrong doesn't matter what you tell them in that sense. It's great that you tell them, but when there's no reinforcement behind it, you're telling them opposite. You're telling, giving them two messages. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. By the way, you want to create a religious monster? You live hypocritical in front of your children. You'll create a religious monster. I preached it years ago, how to raise a reprobate. Go back and listen to it. I'll preach it again. But how to, how to raise a reprobate. You want to li live that hypocrisy in the home. Live two different ways in the home. Don't be the mother that you're supposed to be or the father that you're supposed to be. And you'll, you'll, raise, you'll raise little monsters. And they'll grow up to be big monsters. And they'll resent God. Why? Because God wasn't enough to change your heart. Why would he be enough to change theirs? That's just the facts. That's the way it is. And you have to understand that. And he said, well, I learned wrong. I really don't care how you learn, to be honest with you. I care what you follow now. I'm not going to hold your past against you, and you're certainly not going to use yours as an excuse to do evil. How about that? How about I don't use your past against you, and you don't use your past to live like a devil and make excuses for why you can't grow? Think about that for a second. Well, I can't. I, I've been through that. Look, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not downing you for what happened to you in your past and the sins you committed. I sure ain't going to let you use it either to get away with doing wrong. I'm not going to let you use your past, right? To get you husbands, I won't let you say, well, I, I, this happened to me. That, I, I'm sorry those things happened to you. And I'm sorry you did some things that you regret. But you know what? You're a new man in Christ Jesus, which means you follow the instructions from this book that you're given and you stop making excuses for your life. 
No one, look, there's people that make things happen and there are people that make excuses. And by the way, I mean that by all the grace of God. I don't mean we make it happen on our own. You know what I believe about that. You know it's the Holy Ghost of God in us. I know that. But God says you have to act. You have to add to. You have to work on. You have to put on. You have to take off. You have to do all those. Those are things that you're commanded to do as a child of God. That's right. Walk, stand, right? Those are commands of God. It's not, there's nothing passive about our Christian life, our spiritual life. In anger, in malice, we're to be passive, right? We're not to be aggressive. We're not to be angry. But it's spiritually, we're to fight. That's right. The Bible warns us about that. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. A man that loves his wife will teach his wife, will give her instructions, will help her, will be affectionate towards her, and teach her. That's what we do. Look what it says here, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the way, if you're not going to take the scriptures and correct your wife, you might as well not do it at all. Because your vain philosophies aren't going to do any good. They'll do about as good as, as, as the book of the month club from Oprah. How's that worked out? Right? Not too good. Your philosophies and your ideas, I don't really care about them. Neither does God. He says count it all but dung. What do we care about? Scripture, principles, right here in this book. This is what we follow. This is how we teach. We teach with the Bible. You don't teach with your anger. You don't teach with your bitterness or your wrath. You teach with the Word of God. That's what it says right there. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That your wife should be holy and without blemish. That's the goal. Now, if you're too busy with life that you don't have time to do that, well, that's unfortunate that you're derelict in your duty. Maybe you're too busy. Amen. Also, you wives better learn to fight for your husbands. This world is full of temptations, and you have a duty to love your husband, to take care of him, to do all the conjugal duties of a wife, to put out the fires of lust by keeping the fires burning at home, no matter how you feel. Obedience is love. Love is obedience. We show our love through our obedience. If a woman says she loves her husband but will not obey him, she is a liar. And the main person she is lying to on this earth is herself. Fooling herself into believing that she loves her husband while ignoring him and rebelling against him. That's not love. It's like saying, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he said, right? Why? Because he showed this is true love. This is, you sh- you, how do I show my love to the Lord? I obey him. Right? I obey him. Right? You do his will. That's right. How does a wife do it? Same way. She obeys her husband. She does his will. Now, we understand there's, there's always biblical authority over everything else. So if, if a husband wanted you to do wrong, that goes without saying that you follow what's right. You follow the Bible. God's authority is above all other. But here's the point about, here's the point. That's generally not the case. This book tells you that if you love Jesus, you keep his commandments. You show that love by being obedient. And wives show their love to their husbands by being obedient to their will. That's just plain as day. That's one of the best ways that you can show you love your husband, that you obey him. Does that bother you to say obey, to be obedient to your own husband? Does that bother you? Ladies, does that bother you? Does that... Does that do you start getting this feminist flag that you want to wave up in the back when, when somebody, when you hear that word obedience?
Because that's 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 that obedience right there. That 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 is the opposite of feminism. It's the opposite of it. And and if you have a hard time being obedient, you have a hard time loving. Period. Being obedient is to love, and it's of God. It's God's way. Your holy war is to love your husband through all things. You parents, part of your holy warfare is your children. Your work is not done until you are dead. You understand that? Your work is not done as a parent until you're dead. No, when they're raised, no, it's not done. Your work is not done until you're dead. And then you go home to be with the Lord. You're, who do you think is supposed to help advise them and guide them even when they're out of your home and they're grown up and they're, they're raising children of their own? You are. You better be the example that you're supposed to be for them. So they have somebody to come back to talk to. Your work is not done until you're dead. While they're... While they are young, we teach them all the lessons we can. We instill in their character all that we can, and we fight for them. We wrestle in prayer for them. Part of your armor is prayer, isn't it? Part of the weapon you have, praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all saints. You're to pray for your children. You're to pray for the souls of your children. And by the way, if you do, their rebellion stands no chance. Because God will eventually deal with them. He'll eventually break through their heart. You're praying for them. You continue to pray for them. God will break their hearts. The Bible says praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying and watching. Praying and watching. But do, do you watch your children? Do you watch their, their life? Do you watch what they do? And do you look for ways to better them and to help them? Because there ought to be times where you see, you know, there are times that my wife and I, that, we, that we'll sit down when the children are in bed and we'll sit and, and there's something that has come up and we'll sit down and we'll talk about something and I'll look at her and I'll say, well, we need to work on this. Or she'll say, this is, this is an area of concern. And we, we pray about that and we look at that and we, and we immediately look to see how we can help them to learn to get that out of their character, to repent of those things, that that is not right behavior or a direction that they might be going. Or if you see a hardness in one of your children, if you see a lack of compassion in one of your children, the last thing you're to do is alienate that child. The, the thing that you need to do is love that child more. When something is hurt, it needs more attention, not less. You coward. Cowards run away. Cowards run away from their responsibilities when they see a problem with their child or a problem with their wife. Don't be a bunch of cowards. You stand up and fight for them. And I mean it. That's why I'm yelling at you. I mean it. You stand up and you fight for them. You don't let the devil have them. You don't let him get his clutches on them and say, the hell with them. I'm going to let them go. They won't listen to me anyway. You fight. You don't just let your children go to hell. You don't just let you. You think I'm going to let any one of you go that easy as your pastor? You don't think I'm going to come looking for you? I am. Amen. You call the cops on me. Say, get this crazy preacher out of here. I don't care. Won't be the first time I had the cops called on me. Remember, I'm a street preacher. It happens often. But I'm still coming. You can threaten to beat me up and write me letters and all kinds of stuff. I don't care. I've been beat up before. Are you going to do send me home early? You ain't stopping me. Amen. You go looking for them. You don't, you don't run away when you see a problem with your family. You want to watch your kids go to hell? Go ahead and be a coward and turn around and not face anything. 
and not deal with it. Walk away from it. Say, I can't, I can't do anything. You know, <laughs> you can do a lot. You can pray, you can fast, and you can preach, and you can teach, and you can love them, and you can continue on, and you show them the more affection. You give them the affection and the love that they need, and you pour that on them. If there's a problem with my wife, if there was a problem with my wife with coldness, what's the best thing I can do? Well, I think I'll just leave her alone and I'll stay away and I'll do this and I'll do... That ain't going to solve nothing. No, that, that don't do nothing. Yeah, it does something, something bad. It makes more, it makes more division. No, you go after them. Any time in my marriage that I've ever had trials and challenges or anything came up, when that happened, God said, you go after that and you attack that with everything spiritually you can. And you fulfill my will. And you do my bidding. This is my book. And you're my children. And you will do what I say. That's what God says to his children. You're not going to take the philosophies of the world, live and let live give up on them and walk away from them? Ah, oh, no, you ought to be afraid, children, because my prayers, I won't stop praying for you. I won't stop praying for you. I won't give up on you. I'll beg your name before God until God breaks your little heart. I promise you that. I'm in it till the end, friend, by God's grace. And you better be too. You better be in the fight. You think God gave you that family so you could give up on them and not protect them, not keep them and not, not nurture them, not guide them, that you could just walk away from them and make excuses? You have no excuse. You've been given a duty to perform, and you perform it until the end. You have no right to turn back. You have no right to let the devil have them. You have no right to let up off, off of what's true. The Bible says supplication is entreaty, it's humble, it's earnest prayer and worship. Excuse me, that's what Webster says. Supplication is what the Bible says, praying with all prayer and supplication. Supplication is humble and earnest prayer. That word fervent comes to mind. Fervent, ardent, very warm. Earnest, excited, animated, kind of like what you just saw, right? What do you got to yell about, preacher? Why? Why do you? Some some lady asked me the other, or put on there the. You know, I like listen to you, but why do you yell? I don't know. I watch pastors falling out of the ministry, shacking up with whores, walking away. When I watch people that serve the Lord for years walk away from God. When I see people get hard and cold-hearted and walk away from their families, not fulfill their responsibilities, turn lukewarm like Laodicea, live like that. Pastors and people that I served with for years walking away from the truth, compromising everything. I think there's good reason to yell. When I see, I, I think there's good reason. I think it's worth fighting for. I think you're all worth fighting for, and I love all of you, and you're worth fighting for, and that's why I'm gonna fight for you. And I do fight for you. I do go to the God of heaven, and I do pray to him for you, and for your children, and for your families. And I lift their names up to God daily. Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, it says again, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. If you're not careful, you'll discourage your children. Some of them are discouraged. That's why they've blocked out all spiritual things. You better find out why. You better probe that heart. There's been different times with different children of mine that I've had to probe their heart and find out just exactly what's going on, why they're acting the way they are and what's wrong with them and what's, what's going on. I've had to do that. You have to do that. You're not just a seed giver, you're a father. 
Hope you remember that. You don't get to check out. You don't get to check out of your responsibilities. Your, your wife is not a father. You understand that, right? Maybe you don't. Well, I'll tell you again. Your wife is not a father. You are. You have to be a father. And you have to stand up and fulfill your responsibilities. You don't get to check out of your responsibilities. You're going to answer to God for how you fathered. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer. You mothers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer. You want to know the scariest answer I heard from Charles Spurgeon's mother when he looked at her? She looked at him and said, Charles, it'll be a sad day when I have to witness it. God throws you into I can say that to you that are not saved here today, that have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. It'll be a sad day when I have to witness against you. Sad day coming. Sad day coming. To witness against you because you never turned to Christ. You never believed the gospel. You did not turn and believe the gospel. You rejected it. James chapter 5, verse number 16 says, Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another. You may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you believe that? Do you believe the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? Who is a righteous man? A saved man. That is a righteous man. The Bible says they are the righteous. Let me ask you do you believe that? You believe the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a saved man, availeth much? Then pray. If you believe it, then pray. Pray very specifically. Pray very fervently that God would save them, that God would keep them. You do realize that God can, God can save any one of these children. There is no case too hard for God. God can make any ground good. Amen. Any ground good. You believe that, don't you? I hope you do. Because he made your ground good. You didn't make your ground good. I didn't make my ground good. I did. All you have to do is but ask. All you have to do, whosoever will may come. That's the gospel. Whosoever will may come. Repent ye therefore. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That's the gospel. That's the promise of God. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is able to take that old wicked stony heart of yours and give you a heart of flesh. Give you a heart that can move and love God. He is well able to do that. Well able. Right? You need to pray for your children, not complain about them. Now, asking somebody to pray for them and counseling, and that's not complaining. That's appropriate. That's what you're supposed to do. Get help when you need it. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. But we are responsible for much of what happens to them while raising them. Children are an investment. A spiritual investment God has given you. You're to invest in them. You're to invest everything. By the way, you hear, you ladies, you moms, you, you, you mothers, you hear, you hear somebody, uh, uh, or you see the Apostle Paul when he said that he would gladly be spent for their souls. Why do you think you're immune to that as a mother? You're to be spent for the souls of your children. You are to be wore out, tired, you are to be that way, in that sense. You are to be that way. That's your, that's, that's your ministry. Your husband first, your children second. That's your ministry, and you are to be spent for them. 
That should be your life and your legacy. They are your legacy. What did God tell Sarah? Kings shall come from her. Princes and kings shall come from her. You're no different. You have a duty. By the way, this, this modern day environment that we live in is very conducive for wives to be lazy. It, it, it can't, I, I, I'm serious, it can be that way. They can be very lazy and be very distracted. And, and, and they can easily be distracted and mothers can be easily distracted from what their main work is. Their main duty is to love their husband and to love their children. By the way, that is the order. Love their husband, love their children. That's the order. God's order. Love their husband, love their children. Mothers and fathers being spent for their children and raising them for Christ. I ask you, are they not worth fighting for? You really want to give up? You really wish to give up and, 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 and walk away or make your life easy and say, well, I, I don't like confrontations. Well, you better get over it. Some of you say, I, I, my nature, I don't really like confrontations. I don't care. Tough. Tough you don't like confrontations. This Christian life is one big confrontation. Satan hates you, you have an enemy, and he wants to destroy your family. This world hates your family, hates this book, hates how your children are being raised, and they want you to follow their manual of how to raise children, which means that they don't know if they're boys or girls, and we can cut off their privy members if they don't like what they have, and we'll just give them hormones and take something else. I hope God's people are finally finished with listening to the world tell them how to do things. I really hope they are. I really hope, I, is that enough for you to just be done with, with, I mean, it should have been a long time ago, but what I'm saying, is that enough for you to be done that I don't really want to hear anything? Like people say, you said to that old woman out there, you, when you were preaching out there and you told her you didn't want to hear what she had to say and you just kept, because she was supporting the transgenders and all this other stuff and taking little kids in there and my son's a homosexual and all this other stuff and she was mad and you didn't let her talk. Well, I don't want to hear anything she has to say. Hey. No, I, I, I actually feel really good about it. I felt good about it then, and I feel even better about it right now. I really do. You know why? Because her philosophy stinks. Like Satan. Slimy. And she didn't need, I don't need to hear what she had to say. She needs to hear what I had to say. I'm speaking for the king. She needs to hear the word of the king, right? She doesn't need to hear. She doesn't, she, she doesn't need to. I don't need to hear from her. What is she going to tell me? Humanism. Satanism. She told me how she turned her, how, well, <laughs> she said her two sons, my two sons are homosexuals. And yes, I'm going in there. I'm like, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, 80 years old, walking into that place with a bunch of drag queens. What's the matter with you? They don't hear nobody talk straight to them like that. I don't, I don't care about your philosophy. I don't want anything to do with your philosophy. I'm here to preach them down, and then I'm here to go home. Because they're sick. They're sick. And that an 80-year-old woman would walk around and act like that is absolutely deplorable. It's wicked. It's vile. Disgusting. Proves to you that just because somebody's older doesn't mean they're right. Are your children worth fighting for? Even through their rebellion and immaturity, their annoyances and their character flaws and all the moodiness of their lives, are they not worthy investment as gifts from the Lord, as blessings from God? Should we not have a holy war for them and go to war for them? It does no good to be merely a hearer of the word. We have to be doers of the word. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh 
into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer. So did you know there's hearers that can be forgetful? James warns us, don't be a forgetful hearer. You be a doer of the word. You be a hearer of the word, a doer of the word, and don't be a forgetful hearer of the word. Don't forget what you've heard. Put it into practice. How do I not forget it? I put it into practice. That's how I don't forget it. By the way, what's the perfect law of liberty? Right here. Right here, you have it. Right here. This is the perfect law of liberty. Amen. Made me free. <laughs> the Son of Man shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. Made us free, didn't it? But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. How am I not a forgetful hearer? I'm a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. There is deception that comes from hearing only and not doing what you've heard. You'll deceive yourself. Jesus warns us as we finish up with this text. Turn back to Matthew chapter 11. Finish up here. Verse number 16. Jesus is talking about this to these people, to the, and he's, he's explaining these things. Then he goes in to say, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. It doesn't matter what you do. You're never going to get a break from the world. <laughs> They'll never give you the benefit of the doubt. Nope, you don't. And you don't, and they're never going to, they're never going to, they're always going to slander you. That's the way it is. It has to happen that way. But God said, we don't want, we don't want wicked men, um, Anyway, when all men speak well of you, woe unto them, right? That's what the Bible says. We know that. Then began he to upbraid the cities, wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Look at that. You say, well, if I've seen a lot of, you know, some of you children have seen mighty miracles in this church. You've seen God save people, change their lives. You've heard of their testimonies and everything else. And you know what it said? Look what he says here. It says, then he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Oh, they saw these mighty works and they didn't repent. They didn't get right with God. They didn't turn to God. Woe unto thee, Cheros, and woe unto thee, Bethesda, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done unto thee in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. There was no toleration in Sodom. They were all destroyed. In the midst of that holy warfare, you and I have to understand that the warning is given that you can be given all these instructions and not follow them. You can be given all these instructions and not be obedient. Be hearers of the word and not, and not doers of the word. Hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You have a duty and it's to fight a war. And that war means that you fight in every aspect and you fight for your family and you don't back off, you don't give up and you don't let off the gas because, by the way, let me tell you something that I don't do, and, and I would advise you not to do.
this here. There we go. Okay. Um, your children need to do. Your children need to do what you tell them to do. And they need to obey you in all situations. If your children get the impression that you'll take them out of a situation, they will do wrong in every situation to have their way. No, I look at them and say, you know, you're going to obey me no matter what's going on. You're, I don't care what, I don't care how many of your friends are around. I don't care what situation you find yourself in. You're going to listen to the instructions that you're given. Because I'm your father, and these are, the, these are the directions, and this is from the Lord that you're to obey your parents. And you teach them through that. You don't teach them, well, if they don't like something, we'll just do what they want to do. Well, that's a good way to mess them up. Then they grow up thinking that, then they grow up thinking that, you're, that the world has to do everything they want. Right? They don't grow up doing right and having boundaries. And I'm not talking about what the state gives them. I'm talking about what this book gives them. I don't care what the state tells you is okay to do, and I don't care what they say not to do. I, who cares? They say a lot of things. I, I care what this book says. These are, these are the rules that we live by. And we realize we have to live in this system here. But by the way, not everything the federal government says is wrong is wrong in God's eyes. I, just, I, don't, know if you, I don't know if you know that or not or the state government, or any of them. There's so many Christians that have tied the Bible with the American flag that they don't know the difference between the two. So they, so they don't know, oh, wait, I'm supposed to obey them that have the rule over me and everything. Yeah, this book right here, and you're to follow it. Yeah, God has earthly authorities. We understand that. But you know what? And earthly boundaries and things that we're supposed to do, and we have to live in a system. We get that. But ultimately, you're going to obey this. And that's what you teach your children. I don't care what the world teaches you. You obey God. You obey God's word. Amen. But you know what? Even in the midst of all the holy warfare, as we close here, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said that. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you need rest, you find it in Christ. That's where it is. It's not in the world. It's not you and I are going to always have to war, but there ought to be a time when we're alone with God and we have rest from God. That we, that we commune with God in the scriptures, in prayer, and God will give you rest. If you don't have rest, it's because you haven't stayed there long enough to get it. Amen. You haven't stayed there long enough to get it. Oh, I knocked a few times and God didn't answer or things didn't happen that way. And I didn't, I didn't feel this all overwhelming peace. Well, God didn't say anything about you feeling anything. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That's a matter of believing God. That is a matter of how you feel. It's a matter of believing what God says and who God is. In all that warfare, you have rest through Christ, but nowhere else. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but in me, you shall have peace. Be of good comfort. I have overcome the world. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your words, Lord. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, forgive us for our complacency forgive us for our laziness spiritually forgive us for not fighting for our family as we should or fighting for our spouses or fighting the good fight of faith fighting against our sins lord and submitting to you first of all so we can fight the right fight lord help us never to back down never to give up always to press forward till we get home Give us safety, Lord. Thank you for your mighty provision for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the Bible, the word of God. Thank you that we have it and we hold it. Our hands have handled it, the words of life. Help us to share with a lost and dying world that Jesus saves. Oh, Lord, may our lives preach Jesus saves. May everything about us preach Jesus saves. 
Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.